I, you know, I don't have the mindset that a lot of architects have that I need to get every job. I need to win every project. I think that's silly. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Instead, you can be a resource to the community, you can be a leader of the community, and actually plant a vision for how great buildings could be. And in doing so, you can hoist yourself up as an expert in the field at the same time. Episode 32. Let's do this. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we discuss running a great practice so you can quit worrying about paying the bills and focus instead on creating great architecture and leaving a lasting legacy. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture show. Today is part two of our interview with architect Eric Corey Freed, and I guarantee that this interview will blow you away. If you don't walk away from this interview inspired to find your personal calling and make the world a better place, I will personally refund the money you paid for this episode, all zero dollars of it. Seriously, though, you will benefit by listening to this twice. Today, we talk about why Eric tells clients the kinds of buildings they need to build and not vice versa, the biggest threat to your success, how to get press as an architect, and the difference between architects that know how to market and those that don't. And that's just a few of the topics we cover. So without further ado, here's the show. Eric, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's wonderful to have you. And last (laughs) week, we had a fascinating conversation talking about Oh man, it ranged all over the place, but how to get into the the client psyche, how to present yourself, how to not appear desperate and 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 how that's helped you get jobs in your early years of growing to where you are right now. You talked about your firm, Organic Architect and about the kind of projects you do now. So today I want to jump into a little bit you touched on it briefly in last episode about following one's passion and you've been very um intentional about doing this in your own life. And you also mentioned that you have a lot of um, younger people that reach out to you. I don't know, maybe they're younger, maybe they're not, but and ask you for advice. So could you talk to me and tell me a little bit about what you tell aspiring architects? Well, they're all younger because everybody's young, younger than me, apparently. Uh, but <laughs> what I started, um, I guess, starting around the time I launched the firm, uh, I started receiving first letters and now, of course, emails from young people. Usually they're in school or just graduated. So they're, you know, usually in the 20 to 25 range. And they all basically say the same version of, of, of what they're experiencing. They all talk about how the profession is letting them down. Their first job in architecture or what they see is, is going to be their first job in architecture is disappointing. They're going to be doing bathroom details. Uh, they want to make a difference in the world. They're not being given the opportunity. And it just, you know, it's always, it's always in the same vein. So over the years, uh, what I've done is I've uh, essentially, for all of them, I offered to meet with them. Now, when it was first starting, I would get, you know, one, you know, one a month maybe. But now I get about three a day, <laughs> every day. Uh, so it's a little uh, overwhelming. So... You know, I still offer to meet with all of them. And what shocks me is that in a typical year, I get contacted by about a thousand people. And um, only a small fraction will actually take, take me up on the offer to meet with me. But it's still a lot of people. It's hundreds of people in a year. And, um, and when I had, when I, had, I don't have staff anymore, but when I had a lot of large staff, they used to yell at me, you know, why are you spending time talking to these kids? And I, I, I didn't really know why. I just knew that it was something that was important. I knew that it was needed. And then finally, since then, I've, I've realized why. I, I talked to them because I knew firsthand the value of having someone who's experienced share their insight with me. Because when I was, when I was 15, I wrote a letter to um, Malcolm Wells, and he wrote me back. And then when I was 17, I wrote away to Barbara Prince in New Mexico, and he wrote me back. And and these guys became my mentors, and they became, you know, um, they became the reason I stayed with architecture because otherwise I probably would have gotten frustrated and moved in something else. 
So I know the value of having mentors. I know the value of, of just having someone whose work you admire write you back. So if they're going to take the time to contact me, I'm going to take the time to respond. That's, that's my thinking. Uh, it takes up a lot of my time. And I, and I really have to regulate it. Uh, and I, re- I have to constantly watch that I'm not spending too much time on it. But, um, but I've also discovered that there's certain tools that I can create that would help. So over the years, I've created a list of resources that we keep adding to. I've created this goals worksheet, which I think I sent you. You did. Which, um, which I, you know, I, I, I got tired of having the same conversation with them over and over again. So I created these kind of PDFs and said, here, if you want to meet with me, you know, read through this first, watch these videos, and then we're going to talk at a higher level. And over the last six months that we've had these, you know, especially the goals worksheet, I've noticed that my conversations with them have been so much better, so much more interesting, so much more focused, and so much more helpful to them, frankly. But also I notice another side benefit is that a lot of them end up uh, crying. You know, we'll be talking, and I will say to them, what do you want to do, and let's talk about that. And they end up in tears. And this, you know, freaked me out at first. Until I until it happened dozens and dozens of times now, and when I ask them why are you, you know why are you upset and they go well I'm not upset I'm just nobody's ever been nobody's ever spoken to me in this way. So it's a very moving thing. It's a very touching. Okay, I want thing. to pause and right it, there for a second if that's okay, uh-oh. Eric. No, because that's that's powerful, <laughs> and I don't want to let this moment go by. I want to ask you, mark the moment. Yeah, what's yeah. powerful about this conversation? that is impacting them. So when they say no one's ever talked to me like this before, what are they referring to? <laughs> um, well, I walked them through an exercise uh, that they really need to do. They need to fill out the goals worksheet to do it. But I, I walk them through this exercise. And I don't, I don't know if you want me to do it with you or not. But let's say, let's say you're going to play the, the hypothetical 22-year-old. Let's go for it. So I say to them... Um, you know, it's, it's clear that you want to make the world a better place. That should be your job. That should be your mission. So let's see how that can work. Do you think that today, knowing what you know now, with no other experience, no other schooling, no other anything, but do you think that today you could find problems that need solving in your area, whether it's your block, your neighborhood, your city, your state? Could you find a problem that needs to be fixed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Could you brainstorm ideas to fix that problem? Could you come up with you know, ways that potentially would solve that problem? Could you do that today? You bet. you bet. Of course. Could you then find ways to um, present that solution that you developed, the problem that you identified? Could you do that today? Yep. Yep. Could you then take the solution that you, that you drew up for the problem that you identified and find a way to you know, represent it? Is it a, whether it's a diagram or a 3D model or you know, um, a narrative or something? Could you find a way to represent it that you could share with people so they could get it too? Could you do that? Absolutely. And then could you take the, the, you know, the presentation that you created for the problem that, you created, that you've discovered for the problem that you identified could you then do that and deliver it with enthusiasm and deliver it with passion and do it to a lot of people? You Could bet. you do that today? Yep. yep. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to stand up in front of a room full of people. That's, I mean, that's scary to some. Uh, maybe you could record yourself on YouTube. Maybe you could um, make a PowerPoint presentation and narrate it, right? There's lots of ways you could do it that fit with your personality, but you could do that, yes? Yes. Yeah. So if you can do all of those things, you can identify a problem that needs fixing. You can brainstorm potential solutions to that problem. You can find ways to present your solution in a way that other people can understand it, and you can do it passionately. You can do all those amazing things. You can do them now without further training, without further schooling, without working for somebody else. If you can do all those things, why aren't you? Honestly, why aren't you, why aren't you doing them now? And I'll tell you why. You're not doing them because you're afraid. You're afraid of looking stupid. You're afraid of failing. You're afraid that you're going to spend a lot of time and effort in something that's not going to work. 
Okay, so when, when you when you have that actual conversation, and that was powerful, when you have that, do you <laughs> you ask the rhetorical yeah. question at the end? Why are you not doing it? Do you wait for a response and you go through that, yes. or do you just, yeah. or is it a rhetorical no, 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 question? I, no, so you, I let them I let them answer, but their answer, you know. You, okay, I so let, let me do, take it. Let, let's role play. I, well, let's role play. Okay, so oh, why yeah. don't I do it? Um, I'm not. You know what? I'm not a licensed architect yet, and I mean, I'm going to give some excuses. You know. Um, you know, every excuse, every excuse you're going to come up with, I've heard because there's yeah. there's only about ten of them. Yep. So, and I've got a rebuttal for each one. So we go through. I go, well, okay, tell me why. And they go, uh, I'm not licensed yet. And you know what I say? I say, okay, well, I'm licensed. Why can't I help you? Why can't we partner on it? In fact, you have probably professors who are licensed. Why can't I help you? If you went to a professor and you were that passionate about a solution for a problem that you identified, I guarantee you they would help you. So what's your next reason why you're not doing it? And I, I don't know if you'll even come up with one, but yeah, yeah. I've so let, let's see. I mean, you, you say there's the ten. There's the um, oh, I just you know I could do the presentation. I just don't really know how to talk to people. Right. Well, that's a skill. Talking to people is a skill. When I first presented, I sucked at it, and it was awful. And now I speak to I don't know fifteen, twenty thousand people a year, and I'm much better at it because you just do it one more. I can give you tips. You can also go online and watch free videos and tell you how to do it. You also don't need to do it in front of people. You can, you can record it as a video. You can record it as a PowerPoint presentation. You can write it as a narrative. You can do an interpretive dance. What, it doesn't matter what the hell you do. Just some way to convey it with passion and enthusiasm. That's what's needed. Okay, so all the excuses start disappearing. You get, then you're left there. No more excuses. And, right. and then finally, they, they, you know, there's always one last excuse. And it's that, well, I don't have the money to do it. You know, I don't have savings. I, got, I need a job. And so we talk about the specifics of that. I tell them that, um, well, you don't need money to do it. Because here's, here's what. If you, and I, if you come up with a good enough idea, a strong enough concept, and you and I partner on it, I'll show you how we can get money for it. I'll show you how we can either get investors or, or find an actual client or get grants. And what you do have is you've got tons of time on your hands. What I tell them is that the only difference between them and me, because fundamentally we're the same. We're both idealistic. We're both looking to make the world a better place. Fundamentally, the only difference between them and them and me is that I bill at a high rate. That's really it, right? They're billing, it, if they're lucky, 20 bucks an hour, and I'm billing it more than that. That's the only difference. Everything else is just you know, academic at that point. We both have enthusiasm. I also remind them that now's the time to do it because they're not going to get more idealistic as they get older. They're only going to get less. World, the world and life is only going to beat them down and make them more cynical and more jaded. And eventually they're going to become shadows of their former selves because I've seen it over and over and over again. Guys that I went to school with, friends that I've had for years that have su that had such amazing talent and are wasting it working at some crappy corporate firm, not doing anything that they want to do. And that's not what I want for them. So I want them to strike while the iron's hot. There's a cliche, by the way. I want them. I want them to do it while they're young and still idealistic and still capable of doing it. And I'm. I offer to help them. You know, I say let's partner on it. And that's usually when they start crying, quite honestly. Awesome. Uh, but I that's. I, that means that I've gotten through to them. That's it. That's the good news. Awesome. So, still reeling. No, I think, <laughs> I love how you turned, you're probably the first interviewee that's interviewed me, Eric, so I yeah, have I, to hand it I to you, well to, done. Tend to do that. That was wonderful. Um, next episode of Business of Architecture, I'm going to have you be the interviewer, so if you can make a list of people who you would like to have on the show. Sure. <laughs> so, Eric, can you share, are you willing to share your goals worksheet with our listeners? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, so we can put it's, that out there for them to use if they if they I so want choose. Them, I, want, I want them to use it. It's a helpful tool. It's 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 really based on the conversations that I had over the last ten fifteen years. Yeah, and and I found that instead of having the same conversation over and over again, I was going to convert it into a, a form that they can fill out, and then that way it'll get them at a higher level. And it's it's very useful. I make. Um, you know, I, whether you're in high school or in college, I, I make them do it. And now I just send it to everybody. So absolutely, they're, they're, I'd love for them to, to, to use it. Okay. So then my, my follow-up question is going to be this. You, ha you take 
these people through this process, how many of them turn around and implement what you guys talked about? Five percent. Okay. Now, at first, I was dismayed at that, and then I, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a mentor, reminded me that five percent is all you'd expect from anybody. Five percent of the population are the ones that are doing amazing things, and so that's to be expected. Yeah. In truth, if if it's just if it, if it helps one person do it, it's amazing. And then, then it's um, totally amazing. But here's what I do know. I do know that after, after 15 years or whatever it's been, since 97, but since meeting with these people and giving them advice, that hundreds of people I, I run into, you know, I'll be, I'll be in Buffalo, New York, giving a talk, and someone will come up to me and go, I don't know if you remember me, but we, you know, we had a conversation 10 years ago, and it made all the difference in my life. And so that's powerful. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So I don't need them all to end up being, you know, president of the AIA. But what I do need is I do need them to have not lived an unexamined life. I do need them to not be boring and banal because we've got enough mediocre people as it is. And I tell them that. I go, if you're interested in being mediocre, go for it. But I'm, then you and I shouldn't talk anymore because that's, I mean, there's enough of those. But if you want to have an unusual life, a life that's different than everybody else, that doesn't fit into some, you know, kind of formula, and actually make the world a better place, then then we can continue the conversation. And that was the part that was the deal with the goals the goals worksheet. Excellent. So isn't that most people want that, I would say. Has that been your experience? No, no most people think they want it. Okay. What's but the difference? They, the difference is when you actually press on it and you force them to make a decision. The thing about writing your goals is it forces you to to make tough decisions about your life. It also forces you to face your own limitations, right? You get to learn what you're not good at. If you write your goals, if you write them correctly, if you're really honest with yourself, you realize, oh, I can't do that. I actually can't. I'm not, I'm not disciplined enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm, not, I'm smart enough to actually do that. I need help to do it. But to me, that's a good because that's an opportunity. I know the things that I'm terrible at, and I, I have partners that I use to overcome that. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for balancing that little voice in the back of our head that says, I can't do that? that's probably wrong versus the realistic understanding of what we really can and can't do. The one thing that I've discovered time and time again is that the worst enemy, the biggest threat to your success is actually you. And that sounds like a cliche, but it's not. It's, it's amazing to me how many people I'll meet that go, I want to do this thing. I'm, I'm so excited. And they, they get all, they bounce up and down about it. And I go, great. Why aren't you doing it? And they go, oh, gosh, no, who's going to listen to little old me? I go, oh, okay, then forget it then. You might as well give up. Like, what's the, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's bizarre to me. I, you know, I, you know, I started the firm, I was 27 years old, and I looked really young. I mean, you know, uh, when I was 27, I looked 18. So it really worked against me. And, I mean, now I look old. But, uh, uh, but at the time... I kept expecting somebody to go, wait a minute, kid, where, where, do you, where are you going? Because I, I mean, I, I worked on a school in New York, and, and uh, people had asked for my hall pass. I mean, that's how young I looked. <laughs> <laughs> right? It was just embarrassing. Yeah. So <laughs> here I am starting my own firm, and I'd be on construction sites, and the subs would say, you know, hey, you're not a kid, you can't be on here. But the amazing part is that nobody stops you. If you have a dream and you have passion and enthusiasm and you go after it, nobody will stop you. They will be actually quite the opposite. They will support you. Yeah. If you have genuine enthusiasm and passion about something, people will come out of the woodwork to help you with either support or ideas or even money. And that's the amazing part. Nobody will say, you know, whoa, kid, you're too young to do that. Because if they do, first of all, they're jerks if they do that. But secondly, they're so insecure themselves that they, they wouldn't do that. There's no age police. Nobody's going to stop you from being too young or too inexperienced. And besides, I think if you're 22, if you're at all modest, you're thinking, gosh, there's so much I don't know. But at 42, you're realizing, oh, my God, there's really so much I don't know. If you're really an intelligent, self-introspective person, uh 
all you as Socrates said, all you know is that you know nothing. So that feeling doesn't go away. That that kind of idea that there's so much in the world to learn, what goes away is your is that you're using that as an excuse to to not start. That's what goes away. So I'm trying to tell these people, 22, don't wait 20 years till you get up the confidence to do what you're able to do now. That's mm-hmm. my point to them. Okay. You have everything you need now. Everything in your tool belt is already there. And and plus, I'm I'll help you, or someone else. Your one of your professors can help you. Yep. Yep. And so that's a lot of them do that because they're doing local projects all, wherever they are. So mm-hmm. their professors help them. So I, I love that. I think it's great. Excellent. Eric, tell me about your thoughts about the responsibility <laughs> architects have. Because now we're going to turn on to your practice. We're going to talk a little bit more about the message that you're spreading as an architect. Tell me oh. your thoughts on architects, our responsibility oh. as architects and as professionals to shape the built environment and... Yeah your message about that? Um, I've always been a bit of a computer nerd. And if you remember the famous old saying that the the mission of Microsoft, they they had it inscribed in their lobby in Redmond, was a computer on every desktop Mm -hmm. in every household, right? That was their mission. They achieved their mission. And then then some. Uh, So in 97, when I started out, I copied that mission, and I said, essentially, every building a green building. That I mean, to me, that was that was success. It also made me realize that it, it doesn't need to just be the buildings I do, because what do I do? You know, if I'm lucky, twenty in a year that I get to touch in some way, uh, at most. So it can't just be the buildings I design, but truly every building a green building. So over the years, everything that I've done is always tied back to that bigger point. So if I'm writing a book, does it help make every building a green building? If I'm, if I'm creating a workshop and teaching 10,000 people, is it pushing to make every building a green building? If I'm doing a radio interview, is it helping advocate to make every building a green building? And if the answer is no, then I don't do it. It's really that simple. Uh, but uh, otherwise, that's my mission. That's my goal. So to that end, I think that we as architects have a duty. I think we have a responsibility. In addition to making a building that meets code and resists the effects of gravity and is waterproof, I also think we have a duty and responsibility that the building not make you sick, that the building not intentionally waste energy, that the building conserve resources. I think that's our duty and responsibility. You could argue that the AIA has written that into their contracts a little bit, but not really. It's not enforced, and it's certainly not part of the national bylaw that's going on. I think that we need to make where an architect says every building is a green building. Yet most architects that I meet say the opposite. If a client comes in and asks me for it, you know, great, and I'll call you, or, or you know, I'll, we'll get the young person in the office to make it a lead building. Like that's the kind of crap they say. Yeah. But nobody's going to come into your office and say, oh, design me a cutting-edge, innovative green building, especially when you've never done it before. In fact, I, I would argue that it's implied that there's a social contract. The client doesn't come in and say, build me a code-compliant building either. The client doesn't come in and say, build me one where if there's a fire that I can get out easily. That's assumed. It's part of the social contract. I think, too, it's assumed that you're going to build me a building that won't give me cancer or Alzheimer's, or asthma. So the clients are never going to bring that up. It's never going to happen. And yet architects are magically waiting for this day that if the client comes in and asks for it, or oh, totally, I'm ready. Well, that's, that's shirking your professional duty. That's shirking your responsibility. Eric, you know I like playing devil's advocate here on the show. <laughs> My clients, they can't afford green buildings. <laughs> right. Um, here's the way it works. My Clients, I don't know what you do. My clients all have a budget, a pretty strict one. That's the money they can spend. That's what we build the building for. They don't magically get more money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, some have, but smaller budgets than they should have. But still, we build we build something. We do something for that budget. Yeah, and we make it great. So it's not like suddenly I'm asking them to produce ten percent more. Here's the difference. 
could I have made the building a little bit bigger if I used cheaper, nasty, more toxic materials? Yeah, probably. But why would I want to? Just because they're available? Just because they haven't been outlawed yet? They, they, unlike lead paint and asbestos, they haven't been made illegal yet? No, that's stupid. Knowing what I know about formaldehyde, why would I knowingly add it to a building? Knowing what I know about VOCs, why would I knowingly add it to a building? I mean, I have to, you know, I, I see these people socially, my clients. You know, they, I'll have dinner at their house. I'll, I'll, I'll see their, I'll play with their children. I'll bounce on my knee. Why, how could I knowingly, oh, here, little Susie. Yeah, you'll probably get, you'll probably get asthma now. But at least we made the building as cheaply as possible. That's just stupid. It's not for me to, to debate. It's not for me to argue. It's, it's also not for me to ask the client. You know, can I please not put cancer causing chemicals in your building? It's not that's not my duty. I wouldn't put as I wouldn't put asbestos in the building, not because a law tells me not to. I wouldn't do it because it's a bad material. I wouldn't put paint in a building for the same reason. Why would I just because nobody's bothered to make a law yet? Why would I do that with VOCs? It's silly. We're playing this game of denial, and we're supposed to be professionals. And we wonder why we have no credibility as professionals anymore. That's why. Clients come to us for vision. Clients come to us walking in and saying, I want a house. I want an office. They don't say, give me an innovative, code-compliant one that resists gravity and earthquakes. That's stupid. It's assumed. So I just force it on them. That's what they're coming to me for. That's what they're coming to us for. So that's what I mean by professional responsibility. Excellent. <laughs> I know there are people that will disagree with that, but, um, but you know, knowing what we know and knowing the long-term effects of all these things, you can't in good conscience do that. And you can't hide behind the fact that nobody's outlawed yet. It's just, that's immature. That's, that's barbaric, isn't it? I, I'm interviewing here, Eric. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for taking me down that, that, um, I'm I'm trying to imagine the questions that, you know, other architects have as as they listen to this interview. So I appreciate that. So we've covered a lot of ground in the past two interviews, and I'm sure we I, I can already think of a couple days more of topics that we could touch upon. Eric, one thing that I'd like to close the interview talking about is a little bit about your view on building authority as an architect, and in other words, gaining that respect that differentiates you that because I've seen that some people have difficulty it's difficult to position ourselves sometime tell me about how were you able to write five books tell me your thoughts on <laughs> on writing books well here's the secret the secret formula of how to write books you just work really really hard that's it. that's there's no there is no secret every you know uh, a lot of friends ask me Oh, for the book, did you would you take six, take off for six months or something mm -hmm. so you could write the book? No, I don't know. No, they don't. No, you can't afford to do that. I can't do that. No, it just I um, especially basically sp I spent every night and weekend working on the book, and it sucks. It's awful. I can't wait for it to end. My wife is yelling like, "When's this damn book going to be done?" And every book has followed that same pattern, and so it's six months of sheer hell. But that's what it is. It's about six months. And then it's over. And then you have the book and it's great again. You kind of it's like childbirth. You forget you forget the pain that you went through. Um in terms of your question though, the the it's not a secret. There are some architects that are good at marketing and get it, and, and a lot don't. And the reason that they don't is because of pride and ego. I'm gonna wait for the phone to ring. I'm gonna wait for someone from the media to call me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's it's unrealistic. It's silly. Here's the way you get press. You, you make yourself available to the press. That's it. It's not hard. And when you make yourself available, you don't make more work for them. You don't make it stressful. You don't make it hard. You realize that these are people that have a deadline and are just trying to get a couple quotes about a story that they're working on and they just need to finish. So if you drone on for 45 minutes, they're probably not going to call you back. But if they call you and go, what do you think of um, using zero VOC paints in buildings? And you can be smart and uh, well-spoken 
and speak in nice little sound bites that they easily write down, they'll keep calling you again and again. It's, that's it. It's not hard. Not everybody can do that. And again, I think it's, it's pride and ego, but it shouldn't be. Remember, if your goal is bigger than yourself, to make the world a better place, to make every building a green building, it suddenly makes your priorities pretty clear. I want as many people as possible to hear this message. If they hire me, fine. If they don't hire me, fine. As long as they understand that they need to make their building a green building, then I've succeeded. That's, that's, that's really it. I'm, I'm of the mindset that there's plenty of work to go around. And certainly, as I keep pulling up problems that I see, I keep getting hired from that. I can keep drumming up more work for myself anyway. So I, you know, I don't have the mindset that a lot of architects have that I need to get every job. I need to win every project. I think that's silly. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Instead, you can be a resource to the community, you can be a leader to the community, and actually plant a vision for how great buildings could be. And in doing so, you can hoist yourself up as an expert in the field at the same time. And every, again, it's the win-win scenario. Everybody wins. Yep. Okay. Tell me, Eric, tell me what's on the horizon for Eric Corey Freed. You said you're working on three books. What are we, what are we going to be seeing in the coming year from you? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, a lot of stuff. So um, I'm, uh, I'm doing more with uh, uh, essentially buildings that do five things. And every project I'm trying to do a building that does these five things. One, the building's going to grow some of its own food. It's going to generate some of its own energy. It's going to clean its own water, process some of its own waste, and somehow it's going to sequester its own carbon. And I'm, I've set those personal goals for myself for each building. And I don't always succeed, obviously, but I, at least we have the conversations. At least I don't wait for the client to ask me. I bring it up, and I show them the opportunity and the possibility. Um, I'd love to do a living wall that's edible. I, you know, uh, you know where you can actually like pick stuff off and eat it. It's actually harder than it sounds. Because of it sounds it, because hard. Of, it's hard because of like pollution mm. and and climate. You know, and, like what's gonna grow? What's going to grow in the salt air of San Francisco? Like that's a hard. Mm-hmm. That's a thing. You know, that's actually edible. Um, so living walls actually now to me that's easy. The hard part is an edible one. I was just keynote speaker at a conference called Cities Alive, which is all the green roof people. And, you know, they're all working on that same problem. Yeah. And we're all excited, for you know, but it's, it's kind of an interesting one. To me, that's interesting. That's exciting. Um, I'm, I'm looking at how do we build a building that's a, an organism, you know, a building that breathes in and out and um, processes waste and, and provides habitat for hundreds of species. It, that's, that's my goal. That's the bigger thing. I mean, all this other stuff, you know, it's kind of laughable when I have to do a I have to do a radio show where I'm talking about, yeah, change your light bulbs. I mean, I feel like a schmuck uh, doing that because <laughs> that, uh, aren't, didn't we have that discussion 20 years ago? Aren't we over that? And, you know, especially if I, do, if I do a radio show in the Midwest, that's when I'm, you know, should people change their light bulbs? Yes. Just do it already. Idiot. You know, what's, what are you waiting for? You know, so it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird time to be alive because at the same time that I'm arguing climate change with somebody, I then get to work on, you know, this concept of a building that that moves with its environment the way an organism does. I mean, I'm so I'm, I'm I dance back and forth between this awful, you know, mundane reality and this kind of fantasy world where we're really experimenting with fun things. And and in the meantime, if I can get other people to do it and and join in and participate, then we all win. So that's you know, again, that that idea of the win-win scenario has been really in everything that I do for for the whole time now, and it. And so far, it's worked out pretty well. Excellent. <laughs> Eric, do you have another business book that you can recommend to us? Last time you mentioned uh, From Good to Great by Jim Collins. Do you have another business book that you think we should check out? And it doesn't have to be business. It could be architecture-related also. Oh, gosh. I've got a ton of books. Well, my favorite one is uh, Cradle to Cradle. If you haven't read that book by William McDonough, that'll blow you away. Okay. He, just put out, he put out a new book this year. Um, uh, the Up Cycle, okay, which I haven't read yet. It's just sitting on my shelf here, uh, but I plan on it. I don't know. There's, I mean, uh, I read a lot of books, and but they tend to be pretty technical type books. Okay. Um, Cradle to Cradle is a good. That's a good takeaway. Cradle to Cradle is great. To me, it's a great one because it'll change your perception of how you view the world. Excellent. Was always impressive. Excellent. And um, there's another one called. Um, 
Expo Birmingham, I think it's called um, Small Giants. It's okay. kind of like a good to, good to great kind of thing. And in fact, Jim Collins wrote the forward, which is how I found the thing. And that was also great because it was case studies of socially responsible businesses around the country. And um, just wonderful case studies. And that really was helpful to me. Excellent. But I can send, I'll send you a list and you can send, share it with the viewers. Sounds good. We'll do that. We'll put that in the, in the show notes. And then I'll also put a link to your social media profiles and your website in the show notes. And for people that might not go to the website and are just listening to this via podcast, uh, give me your URL of your website so they can read up on your work and what you're up to. Oh, organicarchitect.com. Very easy. Organicarchitect.com. Well, Eric, it's been a pleasure having you on here. And I hope that we can continue talking and maybe have you on the show again. Anytime. I'd love it. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.